Is everybody all right? Are you good? All right. Blessed. Amen. Beneficido. Is that right? Bendecido. Okay, almost. I almost got it. It means blessed. Somebody asked you, ¿Cómo está? Bendecido. Bendecido. Yeah. Blessed, blessed. Well, guys, tonight I've decided to just take this entire time and just point to Christ for everything. Our righteousness, our holiness, our goodness, our, all that we are, and just point to Christ. I'm gonna, I want to take a whole sermon and do just that. Guys, I had a dream. I had a dream. And uh, I was somewhere, I'm not sure where I was at, but this man, I was being chased by these people, and I believe it was for the gospel. And this man brought me to his house, and he hid me in like this attic thing that overlooked. It was the, at the top of the ceiling of some other room. And he put me inside this room. And when he put me in there, uh, before he shut the door, he looked at me. He says, rest in the grace of God. Rest in the grace of God. I was like, okay, I'm going to rest in the grace of God. And he shut the door and all these people started showing up. And then I woke up. And I was like, man, rest, rest in the grace of God. How do I do that? What do you mean, rest in the grace of God? Because it's not really a, a scripture that says rest in the grace of God. And I understand what rest is and I understand what grace is. Does everybody in this room know what rest is? Yes? Does everybody understand what grace is? Yes? So tonight's message is called Rest in the Grace of God. If you, if you couldn't tell uh, we were going to be talking about grace today, man, you missed it. Four songs in a row. Grace, right? So we're going to rest in that. And so um, I pray that if there's any of you right now in this room that have carried heavy burdens in here, especially with your walk with Christ, and you feel burdened, I pray that when you walk out of here tonight, your burden is gone. And you are able Amen. to rest in the grace of God. Amen? Amen. So He is able to do above and beyond anything we've ever asked. Yeah. Amen. So one of the first verses that, that I wrote down is Ephesians 4.29. And this is what it says, my brothers and sisters, who I want you to know right now before I even begin that I love you dearly. I pray for every single one of you. And God knows whether or not I'm... I'm lying from my lips. I pray for you, just especially pray for you today, last night. And, uh, and I just really pray that God opens your ears to hear this word. But the first verse here in Ephesians 4, 29, it says this. Do not let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it ministers grace to the hearers. So today, tonight... I desire to minister grace to every one of you that could hear the sound of my voice in the sight of our great and holy God. Amen? Amen? So I don't want any corrupt communication coming out of my mouth tonight. I don't want anything like that. All I want to do is I want to minister grace to the hearers. That's what I want to do. And I understand it's like, oh, you know, the way he talks, not just specifically. No, I want to minister grace. I don't want any corrupt thing coming out. I want the truth of God's word to come out and so that when you hear it, it not only edifies you, it builds you up, but it ministers grace. And that's what we've been commanded. That's what Paul commands the Ephesians, right? 429. So my first question is this, guys. How are we saved from sin and from, from God's wrath and from judgment? I mean, if you really think about it, is there anybody in here that would say, well, I'm saved from sin because I go to church. I'm saved from God's wrath because I go to church or God's judgment. And the same uh, we're saved because we, go, we celebrate the Sabbath. Or we're saved because we celebrate the holy days. We're saved because we, we keep the commandments. Or we're saved because we keep the law. <coughs> or how about, well, we're saved because the gospel plus, in addition to all of the things just listed. That's why we're saved. Guys, I want to make this very clear. If we could have a foundational verse for this entire message tonight, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Would you please turn there? Hmm. 
you guys don't mind, I want to read a few verses ahead for the sake of context. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, he has made us alive together with Christ. For by grace are you saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. So how is he saying that God is showing us grace? How is he showing us this kindness? Through the coming of his own son. And then in verse 8 it says, For by grace are you saved. Did you guys see that? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Everybody say, not of works. Not, not of works. works. Lest anyone should boast. And I love verse 10, but I'm not going to read it right now. I'll read it later. So, I see the scriptures here. And I see God showing us a great kindness by sending us his son, his beloved, Jesus the Christ. And I see that by grace, we are saved through faith alone. It's not of us. It was the gift of God. And why the gift of God? So that not one of you or I could stand before his presence and boast of all that we've done. Amen? Amen. I, want you to, I want to define grace for you right now. Grace is defined as kindness. It's defined as favor. It's defined as a gift. It's defined as a credit. And it's defined as a blessing. That is the definition of grace. So if you remember that, it's, it's kindness. It's favor. In the time that we've had here together in the last four years in, in this building, um, I have preached... The twofold ministry of grace. I've done it so many times. And tonight's not one of those nights. I'm actually preaching one fold of it, but explaining this, the first and the second before we actually get into the meat of this. But that, um, that we know that, that grace, according to the Holy Scriptures, is the kindness and favor of God giving us what we don't deserve. That's what grace is. It's, it's unmerited. It's favor that's unmerited, Right? There's not a person here who has merit that could ever receive God's grace because of their merit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we haven't been good enough. We haven't done enough to merit the grace of God. So grace is unmerited favor. It's not that you merited it. It's because of the kindness and the favor of God while you've received it. Does that make sense? And then the second, so that's the first first. Uh, again, twofold understanding, twofold ministry of grace. Number one, it's, it's God's favor and kindness to save you, to give you what you don't deserve. And the second, we've spoken about it many times, it's the power of God to allow you to walk in righteousness and holiness and godliness, but through the power of grace. And the Bible declares that in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. It also confirms that in Titus chapter 2 in regards to the grace and the working of grace. Even Paul in that verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says that I labored more than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So the grace of God being used as a form of, hey, I was using the grace of God to work. So the grace of God not only is the favor and the kindness of God to save me when I don't deserve it, but also the power to walk like his son as he's commanded me to. Amen? So that's a twofold ministry of grace, but I'm not... Focusing on that, but I'm going to bring that up here because the grace of God is so, 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 so butchered today. It's butchered. There's extremes, crazy extremes. I mean, there's a, there's a grace now that's being taught that, that there's no repentance anymore. There's no repentance. There's no need for anything. It doesn't matter. You're covered. You're good. There's a grace that acts as a license to sin. You just carry it in your wallet, and anytime you sin, you just swipe it and say, hey, it's unlimited. Mm-hmm. Or there's a grace that, that, that is, acts as a blanket where people just carry it around and they cover themselves when they want to sin. They take it back off. But because they have this covering, 
that God's okay with it. And that's not true. So I need to make those disclaimers very clear before we get into this because the last thing I want you to do is to walk out of here and say, wow, I can really rest in the fact that my salvation was never because of the work of my hands, but rather because of the gift of God. Wow, that gives me rest to know that. That takes a burden away from me from trying to work out my salvation. And I'm not talking about fear and trembling. I'm talking about working for it. So I wanted to make that very clear before we begin to pursue this thing. I want you all to know that we had no part, and listen, other than repentance and belief. Yes, we have to make the decision to come, to accept what has been done for us. Many people, I've heard people say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter where you came from. God's going to save you no matter what. That's not true. God wants all men saved. His will is that all men would be saved. But if you don't believe in the Son, you have no life. John 3.36 says the wrath of God abides on you because you don't believe in the Son. So you must believe in the Son, right? And you must turn from your sins. Does that make sense? So aside from that, you have no part in your salvation. And, and I'll continue to explain. We did not die for ourselves. Christ did. We did not shed our blood for our sins. Christ did. We have no righteousness of our own. It is Christ's righteousness. And i got to stop there for a second because I want you guys to know as, I, as we pray everything tonight, I want to literally be one of those big old arrows like you see at the hometown buffet, you know, trying to wave people in to come eat. Mm -hmm. I want to be one of those lit up arrows that every time you're just thinking about grace, it just keeps pointing and pointing and pointing and pointing. I never look in the mirror as far as grace is concerned. I look at the Savior because he's the one that's bought it for me. Mm -hmm. So again, we have no righteousness of our own. Our righteousness is of Christ. It is God's grace and kindness that led me to repentance. Did you guys know that? Mm -hmm. It's his goodness, the Bible says, right? It was not my performance. It was not my strength. It was not my know-how. It was not my ability. It's, I'm not saved because I celebrate the Sabbath. I'm not saved because I'm behind this piece of wood and sharing God's word with you. I'm not saved because of any of those things. I'm saved because of the grace of God. Wow. Guys, I'm going to speak as somebody who's zealously taken up this word and I said, God, I just want to just run after you with everything that I am. And that's a good thing to want to do. But then I go out and then if there's a day I'm like sitting there and I'm like, oh man, listen, uh, you know, my dad's going to end up preaching, man, I didn't have a dream, and I feel like, man, Lord, you're upset with me, there's something wrong, I must not be saved, I mean, because I'm not going to get to preach. <laughs> That's not true. My, my, my salvation doesn't rest in my preaching. Now, I can get in a lot of trouble for what I preach, but as far as my life eternal is concerned, it was bought at the cost of the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Again, it wasn't our performance that saved us. It wasn't our strength. It wasn't our know-how. It wasn't our ability. It was Christ. Arrow again. It was Christ Amen. and His grace. Amen. Till this very day, I am blown away how God can save a sinner like me when I brought absolutely nothing to the table. I mean, think about it. God, save me when I was a dirty, wicked, ungodly sinner. Why? I don't deserve it. Grace. What is that? Why would he save? It, it blows me away. It's because that's what I'm talking about. It's the goodness of God that when I consider all that has been done, just for me personally, when I think about it, I even wrote a poem a few years ago. It's called um, The Cost of My Forgiveness. And at the very end of the poem, it says, Please, O oh Lord, never let me forget the cost of my forgiveness. So that I can always remind myself, like, wow, God, you are so good. Why, though? Would you die for somebody who's so dirty while you're so clean? And then I wrote, so that you would be forgiven and live eternally with me. It was at a great cost that we've been saved.
but it blows me away. Because some of you don't come where I've come from, and I don't come where some of you have come from. Not every one of you dealt with drugs. Not every one of you dealt with alcohol. Not every one of you dealt with adultery. Not every one of you dealt with pornography. Not every one of you dealt with lying. and Probably lying. Yeah. <laughs> Stealing, I don't know. Right? But every one of us, we've... Does the scripture, does it prick you at all when you really think about Romans 5, 8 that says God shows his love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us? Notice the verse doesn't say, while you were going to church, while you were celebrating the Sabbath, while you were keeping the law, while you were... No. No. Because there was nothing righteous that I could have done before Jesus showed up that could have ever, ever, ever saved me. Because if there was a way before Jesus came, anywhere in the scriptures that could have saved me, Jesus never had to come. But he had to come. Why? Because there was no hope for any of us. So God sent his son. Before the foundations of the world were ever formed, he predestined his own son to come and take our place. Is that amazing grace? Amen. 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 It is. It is. Beside the working of Christ on the cross, in his death, in his resurrection, there's no righteousness nor salvation that can be found in any of our personal works or anything that we try to do as far as working for Christ. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. So if there's ever any a time that we have thought personally, and I'm going to tell you right now, as a seven-year-old Christian, there's Christians who are in here who's probably dealt with this more than I have. But it's seven years, I can tell you I've dealt with this a lot, where God is moving mightily in me, and, and I'm seeing different things, and he's allowing me to be obedient, and I could look at other people. And I could say, look at that person, look at that person, look at that person, look at that person. Not me. And there's a sense of pride that takes place, right? Yeah. There's a sense of pride that takes place. And then you read a verse that says, uh, Son, you're not righteous. What? I mean, I mean, wait, wait. I mean, come on. No, you're not. There's none righteous. No, not one. So I have a question. I'm, I'm just curious. Is there anybody in here who thinks they're righteous? Now, is there anybody in here who thinks because of Christ you're righteous? Everybody should raise your hand. You are righteous because of Christ, but you're not righteous on your own. Merit. Is this making sense? Okay, are we all right so far? Okay. In Isaiah 64, 6, if this brings it home, I, I, I really hope it does. Isaiah 60, 64, 6, in the middle of the verse, it says, All of our righteous, all of our righteousness, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. What does that mean? God doesn't want them. They're disgusting. And I'll tell you why they're disgusting. And Forgive me, little, little guys, but it, the rag that it's talking about is a woman's tampon. Sorry, that's just what the word says. But that's what it is. All of our righteousness, all of our good works, all that we can do. Guys, notice it doesn't save us. You don't know how many, every religion on earth has something they're trying to do to gain their salvation. But there's only one way the Bible declares that's what separates Christianity from everything else in the world. I talk to Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists and all of these people, and every one of them says, I will have to let my good outweigh my bad, and then God is with me. Or I'll pay it forward. Pay it forward. That doesn't do nothing. That's nice. It's a good gesture. Yeah, it's Christ-like to do the right thing, but it can't save you. It doesn't... Your act of kindness or your act of goodness won't take away all of your badness. For example, let's be logical here for a second. If you were to go in a courtroom today and tell the judge, you know, judge, I understand 10 years ago I committed murder, but in the last 10 years I sold my house, I gave away all my money, I, I worked with the homeless, I mean, I've just literally turned a new leaf, I'm a brand new person, I'm not the same, I don't want to kill nobody anymore. Is the judge going to say... Case closed. He's innocent. He's good to go. No. That's great to hear that you're doing all of these good things, but you still committed a crime. And you still have to pay the penalty for it. Regardless of all of your good works and good deeds. Is God 
more righteous than the judges in Kern County? Yeah. And they wouldn't let him off. Maybe they would. I don't know. Kern County's kind of whack. <laughs> but mm, you know what I'm saying? Is the judges here? And I'll ask people that. If they wouldn't let it slide, it shows me how high you think of him. That he's some unrighteous judge that just says, I'll just pardon it. Did you know that there's scripture in the book of Proverbs that it says it's an abomination to justify the wicked? Didn't God justify the wicked? How does he get out of that one? It was at a great cost to justify the wicked. God didn't just let it go and say, fine, you're pardoned, you can leave, you're on parole, no big deal. No. His son had to pay the cost. His son had to take upon himself the cup of wrath and drink it in every ounce for our sake. God's just and holy. No sin can go unpunished. He had to pour out his punishment on his own son. Grace is sounding really good right now, huh? So Isaiah, so again, there's none righteous, no, not one. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Would you guys please turn to Romans chapter 3, please? kind of helps me sitting down not to get too excited. All right. I got a leash on. So Romans chapter 3 in verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. I'm going to tell you something about the law. It's our schoolmaster, the book of Hebrews says, and also the book of Galatians. And it says that literally as our schoolmaster, we were under it. We were being tutored, right? And when we look at the law, what do we find? All of our flaws, all of our guilt, all of our shame. Man, we've broken it. So it's like a mirror that we look into to find out just how guilty and how sinful we are, right? So we're all guilty before God as far as the law is concerned because there's not one righteous. And if we break one law, we're guilty of, of them all. Verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Did you guys hear that? For by the deeds of the law, there is no flesh that shall be justified in his sight. It says here in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So now where is the righteousness found? It's not found in the deeds of the law, but rather in the faith of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And then it says, for verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in His blood, the sacrifice, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness that the that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. So how is any of you justified in this house but by believing in Jesus Christ? But by believing in Jesus Christ. But then you say, but, but I, I, how? There was men, and they asked Jesus as he was walking, they said, Jesus, how can I do the works of God. How can I be pleasing in your sight? How can I do that? John 6, 29. You might want to write this down. John chapter 6, verse 29. 
Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe on him who he has sent. If you want to do the works of God, if you want to be pleasing in his sight, then you believe in his son. You believe in his son. By the awesome grace of God, we have been adopted as children into God's family. And guys, I want you to know, like I said at the very beginning, my whole job and purpose tonight, like John 12, 32 says, Jesus speaking, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Amen. I don't want to bring any glory or any praise to any man, to anything. There is a lot of men who have done amazing things in Christ's name. There is men who have gone and just, I mean, the martyrs and all that's happened. But I want to lift up Jesus because if I lift him up, he says, son, I'll take it from here. Mine. If I just lift him up, he says, he'll draw. And I know that's speaking of the cross. But man, it works. Trust me. Brother Paul, Brother Patrick, any of these brothers that have been out in the streets. This brother Mikey, you've been out there before. Brother Luis, when we lift up Jesus, he just does the rest. He'll bring all to himself. Because he's not willing that any should perish. Right? And he doesn't cast away anybody that comes to him. In John 6, 37, he promises that. It wasn't us that bought our salvation. Doesn't that give you joy that it was God's work alone that saved us? It should give you great joy. You should have an amazing joy that it wasn't your ability. It wasn't your determination or your zeal. It wasn't anything of you that saved you. It was Jesus the Christ and His finished work on the cross that saved you. And that brings joy. Why? Because every one of us in this room have heaped burdens on our backs to try to go win our salvation. Amen. When Jesus says, Son, it's already been won. What are you Amen. doing? And He said, Come to me. All you that are heavy laden and overburdened, overworked, He says, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? Because my yoke is easy and my burden is what are you doing carrying around something heavy? I didn't tell you to do that. And don't be telling the Lord you're trying to work out either because it doesn't work. He says, I have a light burden for you. Light. And we're sitting there throwing in. It's like, I see the church of Christ losing their joy. Losing it. Losing their joy because they're trying to work for their salvation. Trust me. And I, and I want to say this again as a clarification. I believe in the Holy Sabbath day that God has commanded according to the fourth commandment. I believe when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I believe all of that. Every bit of it. But I can't do it without him. And I've been one that has tried to take on the commandments of God in my flesh and oh, the burden it kills the joy. And I take it upon myself. I can do all things through Christ, the scripture says. See, the thing is, is what we try to do is, is we'll try to take the salvation of God and add to it. And when we start adding to it, instead of saying, you know what, I'm just going to abide in Christ. I'm going to live in him and with him. And he will begin to work out my salvation for me. And he'll start sanctifying me and giving me righteousness and holiness. And he will start doing these things in me. But we as zealous human beings, because we're like, man, it seems like it's taking too long. I'm going to go and I'm going to do this, 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 this. And at the end of the day, it's like, man, God, I, I feel like I fell short. I feel like I didn't do it to the way that you wanted me to. I fell short again. And it's like, what happened to the joy? That when you lay your head down on the pillow at night, it was never your ability. It was God's. It was God's. And I ask this to every one of us because like I said, I've been including myself in all these because I've done these things. Tell me, we, you, who trust in your works to save you or your religious obedience to the law, what will you or I say before the king on the day of judgment? Will you boast in your works? This is why I'm sitting down because I was going to get excited right there. <laughs> Are you going to boast in your works before the throne? 
How many of us will stand and say, Lord, I, I went and got circumcised. I obeyed your law. I went to church every Saturday and Sunday, both services. I'm going to tell you guys right now that it will not be acceptable. And I don't think it's going to go too well for you, according to Matthew 7, when they say, Lord, haven't we, when he says, depart from me? Lord, Lord, haven't I done many wonderful works, cast out demons, right? All of these things, they start bringing up. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more said in those days. I don't know, but that's what I see in Matthew 7. And they bring up all of their works, all of their acts of righteousness, all that they had done. And God says, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that practice sin. You that practice sin. Would you guys turn with me to Luke chapter 18, please? So I want to I want to consider this. This wasn't supposed to be a part of the met, or at least I didn't think, but the Lord knows better than me. When I read this, man, it messed me up. It was a couple of days ago, and I was I was actually uh, giving blood on uh, on Thursday, and I was sitting there as they were taking my blood, and I was reading the scriptures, and I happened to accidentally fall on Luke 18, and man, it messed me up. I really want you guys to see this, so let me know when you're there. Are you guys there? Yeah. Look at verse 9, please. And he spake this parable to certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Before we go, did you hear that? Jesus speaks of a parable about those who trust in themselves that they're righteous. And they despise other people because of they, their belief of their righteousness. Now, real fast, is there anybody righteous? No. no. Yeah. Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. So just so you know, I don't know if you know about this, but the Pharisee was a religious man. He was a Jew, right? Heavily doctrinated. And then the publican, he's a sinner, a tax collector, right? So you have two sides of the spectrum. The Pharisee, verse 11, stood and prayed with himself. And this is what he said. God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give, I give tithes of all that I possess. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. Is that going to be any of us? I, I, I. I did this. I did that. I, did, I thank you that I am not like so-and-so. And then he even calls out the publican who's standing afar off. Could you imagine how that publican feels? And Lord, by the way, while we're talking about it, that person right there, that wicked sinner, I'm just glad I'm not like them. Praise the Lord. And this guy standing in the back, verse 13, standing afar off, he wouldn't even lift his head to see heaven. He wouldn't even lift up his head to look above, but instead he says he smote upon his breast, his chest, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That jacked me up. Does that mess with any of you guys right now? Here's a guy, a religious guy, who brought all of his stuff to the table out loud. and says, oh God, you know, look what I'm doing. Look at all that I've done. And this sinner stands in the back and beats his chest and he just says, God, I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me. And Jesus says in verse 14, he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other because every one that exalts himself shall be abased and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So Jesus says, only one of them was justified. Just one. Wow. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, please.
2 Timothy chapter 1, please. Are you guys there? Please look at verse um, verse 8. Be not there, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. You guys there? Mm-hmm. Be not ashamed of the testimony of, of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Did you guys hear that? Christ saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of what we're doing or what we've done, good or bad, but rather to his own purpose and his own grace, which was given in Christ Jesus. There he is again, our Savior, before the world Began. So before the world was ever formed, but God, before God spoke it into existence, what happened? He had a plan. It says, verse 10, But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Once again, amen. Praise be to him. Would you please turn to the left, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are you guys there? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. We good? For you see your calling, brothers, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Is God choosing the pics of the litter? Verse 27. God bless you. But God has... God bless you again. Double blessing. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base, the humble things of the world. And the things which are despised has God chosen. Yes, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. So that, here's the whole purpose. That no one would boast in his presence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made to us. So God doesn't choose the mighty, the strong, the wise. He doesn't choose them. Why? Because they think in their abilities or in their power, they're going to win themselves whatever they do. But instead, God says, I choose the weak, the humble, maybe the, not the best of everything. But I chose them. Why? So that nobody could stand before me and boast because the man or the woman that I chose knows she can't do it without me. Think about Gideon. Think about Gideon. We were just talking about this. Uh, we went to a, uh, this morning, there was a, a men's breakfast early this morning in McFarland. And uh, Brother Manny, you guys know Brother Manny, he was speaking this morning. And he was speaking on living in the light as Christ is in the light and putting on the armor of light and just walking in Christ and all of this stuff is amazing. But he talked about Gideon and it reminded me. Gideon had 22,000 soldiers to approach a multitude of an army that was greater, it says, than the sand of the seashore. Right? And when God looked at the army and 10,000 were removed from this army, right? How many does that leave us with? 22,000 minus 10,000. Wow. It took you guys a while. Put you on the spot. Sorry. He was just like, one, two, three, four, five. Wait. So 12,000. 12,000. And you know what God told them? We're still not good. Why? 
you still have too many men. Because when I give you the victory, that you guys can still say, by our hand, by our might, we have won us this victory by my own hand. And God says, that's not happening. So what did he drop their army down to? 300. So that there's no way that 300, it's not possible that 300 men can take on such a great multitude unless God be with them. So that no man can boast in his presence. And that's what God does. Why? So that he can get all of the glory. That's why. So he can get all the glory. And even in verse 30, it says this. But of him are you in Christ Jesus who of God is made to us. So be, that Jesus is, so listen to this, Jesus is our wisdom. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our sanctification. And Jesus is our redemption. Did you guys all see that right now in verse 30? Again, I'll read it. But of Him are you in Christ, who of God is made to us. Wisdom. Righteousness. Sanctification, redemption. That, verse 31, according as it is written, he that glories or he that boasts, let him glory in the Lord. My wisdom is not mine. My sanctification is not mine. My redemption is not mine. And my righteousness definitely is not mine. So what am I going to do with that? I'm going to praise the one whose it is. Jesus, and I will boast in him. Amen? Amen? Let us boast in Him. Paul, the apostle, stood up against those that promoted salvation by Jesus plus something else. He came against it constantly. There's all kinds of books that are written that Jesus, that, forgive me, that Paul wrote regarding Jesus plus. Promoting salvation by works. Salvation by by circumcision, salvation, by all of these things. And guys, you know what's strange about this message? I had a call from a man who goes to this church. And there's a man that lives right next to him who's a uh, Hebrew roots person. Which I greatly disagree with that, but that's not what I'm going to go into. Hebrew roots movement is to get, get that car checked out so it's not wrong. <laughs> and he told him today at his door, or forgive me, he told him yesterday at his door, and this is what he said, are you circumcised? And this man said, no. And he says, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised. And he says, what? He's like, what? What are you talking about? Where did that come from? Has anybody in this place ever heard somebody tell somebody that? That they need to be circumcised so that they could be saved? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This isn't old, or forgive me, this isn't new. Paul dealt with this stuff. He did. He dealt with it. So as I was sitting there, I asked this man, and I'm not going to describe who he is. I don't, I, it's really not that big of a deal. But I told him, I said, hey, next time your neighbor comes outside and you meet him at the same time, Ask him to go read the book of Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 through 6. In regards to circumcision and being saved. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that why. So it was just amazing to me. Here I am preparing for this message of it's the grace of God that for the sake of salvation. This is what we're talking about. For salvation there is no work that could save me. Why? Because guess what? Circumcision was before Christ came. The law was before Christ came too. If that could save me now, then Jesus wasted his time. Does that make sense or no? Jesus did not have to come if I could have been saved by anything before him. That makes perfect sense. Yes? No? Yes. Turn to Acts chapter 15, please. So he was told that I was talking to one of my, um, there was a, a, a retired pastor, his name's Oscar Perez. I was speaking to him today. The Lord allowed me, believe it or not, before it started raining, he allowed me to go sit on the bluffs and just seek his face while I was writing this and ended up getting to speak with my boss. And Well, he's my boss, but he's a retired pastor. His name's Oscar Perez. And 
as I was talking with him, I said, man, I said, it's amazing. I said, I was talking to a brother and he had told me that he was, you know, he's living next to some people who were part of the Hebrew Israel, or Hebrew Israelites, Hebrew Roots Movement. And um, they had mentioned that, that he needed to be circumcised to be saved. And immediately he's just like, how do you keep running into all of these people? And I said, what, I, you never dealt with this? He's like, no. He's like, this is crazy. He said, what is happening in 2019? What's going on? Why are all of these things coming against the grace of God? What's happening? In Acts chapter 15, listen to this. I'll let God's word stand on its own. It's clear. And certain men which came down, Acts 15, one, are we all there? Yes. Okay. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brothers and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, so they argued, and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. This is called the Jerusalem Council. In verse 3 it says, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through uh, Phinis and Samaria, declaring the conversation, conversion excuse me, of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. Verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So these Pharisees were believers in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And they said, it was needful to circumcise them and to command them that they should keep the law of Moses. So they're saved now. Well, they need to get circumcised and they need to keep the law. Is it clear? This is what the Pharisees are saying who became believers. This is what they're selling Paul and Barnabas, that they need to tell their Gentile friends that this is what they need to do. Verse 6, And the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brothers, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Who was that? That was Cornelius, right? By Peter. You guys remember that from last week? My dad taught on that. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. He's like, hey, just remember these Gentiles, they're getting saved too. And not only are they getting saved, they're getting the Holy Spirit. And then listen to this. And put no difference, verse 9, between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Here we go. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God? To put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. At the Jerusalem Council. Because these men were saying that they need to keep the law of Moses and they need to get circumcised. And he said, what are you guys thinking? Are you trying to tempt God? Are you trying to put a yoke back on the necks of these new believers when we couldn't even carry this weight? And in verse 11, he says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Wow. Amen. Amen. He cleared it up nicely. He says, yeah, we're Jews, they're Gentiles, but it's the grace of God that's going to save us, not the law, not circumcision. Amen. 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 <laughs> it's joy. It's joy. Not because I'm saying like, oh man, no, no. No, because I can't do it. I can't do it. My salvation, if it rests on me, if my salvation is riding on me, I'm going to hell. But if my salvation rests in the hands of the one who loves me more than anybody in this room, I'm going to heaven. Because a way has been made, not because of me, but because of his finished work on the cross. So did you guys just see that? 
Now please turn to Galatians chapter 2. We got three addresses in here that I want to look at. I'm not going through the whole book. But in Galatians chapter 2, would you guys please look at verse 15? And what an understanding of all people when Paul gets up and disputes with men that it's not the law and it's not circumcision that saves us. Of all people, he was a he was a Pharisee, he was a lawyer, he knew the law. Of all people, why would he dispute that? Because he knew. That it couldn't save him. It was the grace of God. And in verse, forgive me, Galatians chapter 2, are we there? Mm -hmm. Verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Same guy, this is Paul right here. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law so that I might live to God. Listen to this. These last two verses here. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm living, yet not I, but now Christ lives in me. What is he saying? Listen, I've died to the old man, and now it's Christ, his grace that saved me. Now it's his power that's working in me. I was only saved by him, and now past salvation. Now the works that come because of salvation, now he's working in me. He says, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ, he's living in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And look at verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, or his death was useless. That's why I say that if anything before Christ could have saved us, such as the law, such as the prophets, such as circumcision, any of these things could have saved us, then Christ never had to come. And this is what he's saying here. I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God because righteousness does not come by the law. And if it did, then Christ's death is useless. He never had to come. He never had to come. Does that make sense? I'm not pulling this out of nowhere, guys. I'm giving you the scriptures. Please, a couple chapters over Galatians 5. So remember when I told you that my friend, and so, so Paul dealt with this, Barnabas dealt with this, and now my friend dealt with this, being told that he needs to be circumcised, to be saved. And also, I personally, if uh, me and brother JJ were out preaching the gospel, you guys know who JJ is. We were out here on the, on the, um, on the uh, bluffs, and actually, Mikey, you met the same guy that I did. He was a Hispanic man, but now he was a Jew because he came to Christ. And so now he's no longer a, a Spanish man. Now he's a Jew from some different tribe. And he had the kappa on. He had the, the long curly hair. He was wearing the zitzits. He says he went and got circumcised because of his great love for Christ. And now he's obeying the law. And now he's out. He says he was out watching the new moon. He was out watching. He didn't prepare for the feasts at the time when they were coming. And he was just mentioning about all these things. And I was just like, man. And I said, what do you know about the grace of God? How, how are you saved? And his answer was, well, I'm obedient to God's law. And he said, and I said, well, I, I kind of started talking to him. And he says, no. He says, you must be circumcised to be saved. You must be. And then he says that when I looked at Galatians, I needed to look through Hebrew eyes because I'm not understanding it. The Bible in the New Testament wasn't written in Greek, or forgive me, wasn't, there's not one translation written in Hebrew. There's 5,000 translations written in Greek, none in Hebrew. If I need to look through Hebrew eyes to look at this, then I need to have a Hebrew translation. And I understand people make Hebrew translations, but this was written in Greek. So he says, no, 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 you, you don't understand. It's not talking about that. It's very clear what it's talking about. And then it says here again, so you must be circumcised. Okay, where does circumcision come from? Since I have to look through Hebrew eyes, circumcision comes from who? Abraham. 
the covenant with Abraham that he must circumcise every, every male child on the eighth day. Right? Look at verse, chapter 5, verse 1. So, to those, so when I heard him out at the bluffs, I told him, I opened the scriptures and shared this with him. And that's why he told me I need to look through Hebrew eyes that I, I, I'm not getting it. This is a false translation. Or that Paul, Paul was a deceiver. They also say that too. And then also uh, to the man who's um, living next to a guy like that, and to any of you who have heard that before, that you need to be circumcised for the sake of salvation. Let's listen to this. I love God's word, man. Galatians 5.1. Stand fast in the liberty, in the freedom. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Which is in Christ. For Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You didn't only, you didn't save your salvation, you just lost it. it profits you nothing. Now, you can repent. You can say, God, it's not by my works that I'm saved. It is by your works that I'm saved. But then look at verse 3. For I testify again to every man. Listen, he says, I'm going to tell you one more time. To every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you want to go get circumcised for your supposed love for Christ and not accept the free gift of eternal life through the grace that was brought to you through the cross, through God's great kindness and favor and love, you want to go get circumcised and start following the law? He said, fine, you're a debtor to do all of it then. 613, let's roll. Oh, by the way, I testify again, verse 3, to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of zero, no effect to you. Whosoever you are that are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. You lost it. Why? Because maybe he heard of the good news and God touched his heart. And he ran into the wrong people who said, oh, you know Yeshua now. You need to go get circumcised, son. You need to start wearing zit zit, son. You need to start doing it. You need to get circumcised and follow the law of Moses now. You will be well-pleasing in a sight then. And I tell you, Paul tells you, Christ is no effect to you, whoever you are that goes and tries to get circumcised for the sake of your salvation. It says in verse 5, or verse 4 at the end, he says, you're fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, it doesn't matter, but what? But faith, which works by love. I want to follow that up. Look at Galatians 6, look at verse 14, please. Galatians 6, 14, the next chapter over. Verse 14 says this. Verse 14 says this. But God forbid that I should boast, that I should glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. Guys, I'm going to tell you straight up. Yes, again, I love, I want to obey the commands of God. I want to do, I can't do it in my own strength. I love the Holy Sabbath day. It's a blessing to my life, but I can't do it in my own strength. Right? Yes, I don't celebrate Christmas and Easter and Halloween and all of these things. And yes, that's a personal decision my household has made because I had to look into it. But I'm going to tell you something. That if I have a chance to boast, if I'm standing before somebody I've never spoken to before, the last thing that I'm going to bring to them is they need to worry about following the Sabbath. They don't know Jesus. What is that going to do for them? Make them religious. Make them think that they've purchased their salvation because they went and did something. Tell me this. The man that hung next to Jesus on the cross who cried out and said, Lord, I deserve this. You don't. This day, will you, for, will you remember me? And he says, this day, you shall be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. He didn't celebrate the Sabbath. He didn't even get to read the Bible. Not the New Testament. Either. He wasn't baptized. He didn't go to church. What did he do? He called upon the Lord. He, he came to a realization of where he was at compared to him. He knew that he was a sinner and that he was guilty. That's why he says, I deserve what I'm getting right now. But you don't. If you are who you say you are, will you remember me? And Jesus said, I, I will. 
This day you will be with me in paradise. This day. Wow. That's a hard one to mess with because people put a lot of their salvation in a lot of other things than Christ. And that one's the, the, the pricker. That's the one that pops the balloon. His holy, holy, holy word. But then, so he says, God forbid, I, if I have a chance to boast, he says, I'm going to boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'm crucified to the world because of the cross, and the world's crucified to me because of the cross. And look what he says in verse 15. And again, Paul continues to hit on it, maybe irritated him, I don't know. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availed anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Tell me, how is a new creature formed? But by the working and the miraculous power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. See? Yes. It is by His power and His power alone. It says that for if any man be in Christ, they're a new creature. Notice it's in Christ. Amen? Amen. In Christ. For the sake, I'm, 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 I'm practically done. So please hear me out this last little bit. For the sake of our salvation, for the sake of salvation, I'm talking about salvation right now. I'm not talking about, you know, okay, as our daily walk is concerned about what we're doing. I'm talking about for the sake of salvation. For the sake of what? Salvation. We have no other hope. But in Christ alone. There is no other name, it says, given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. Rest. Take joy in the grace of God. He will finish the work that He started in you. It's His job. Abide in Him. Surrender your will. Receive this free gift. It's free. It cost us nothing, but it cost him everything. Why reject the greatest thing in the world? God's love for his people and his willingness that none should perish. So by his great kindness and favor, he sends his son. So the last thing I have to say here. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It is not of us. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest anyone can boast. Amen. 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 Yeah. I got one thing I want to share. You guys doing all right? Still kicking? We're still breathing? Amen. Amen. You want me to sound? That's right. Oh, you want to sound? I'm the best one. You guys doing all right? Yeah. I just want to share one verse with you guys where we had earlier in uh, Luke chapter 18. Something he's talking about tonight is so true. The grace of God. It's free, isn't it? And it's like, uh, think about the kids in here in this room. And if you stop at McDonald's and buy them something, are they worried if you have the money in your wallet? No. Do they ask you? Hey, do you have enough money for the cheeseburger to have? Are they asking that? No. You pull up and they're ordering whatever they want, right? Yes. No thought in their mind about getting it, right? No. Well, I had a dream last night. This little boy had gone to church for the very first time. And he's sitting there, and it was on his birthday. This lady walks up and, and hands him this big box. And I'm sitting next to him at the church, and he opens the box up, but the shoes are hidden. So he takes all this stuff out. And he sees the shoes and he's excited. So he puts these new shoes on. But you think about new shoes. What do you think about for the Lord new shoes? He's going to direct your steps, right? Mm -hmm. You're brand new in the Lord. You got your new shoes on. You're walking with him, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, this pastor's there from Canyon Hills. I remember he walks up. I said, hey, Pastor Steve, would you like to take a picture with this, with this a young boy here with his new shoes? He goes, no, man, just him. <laughs> but the word Steve in Hebrew actually means crown, right? Like a crown. Anyway. The Lord gives me stuff sometimes with names, and I, you know, kind of pray about it. But anyway, this little boy, I had my camera, and I started taking pictures of this little boy. And he's standing there with his new shoe, his brand new shoes on, but there's little baby lambs all around him in the picture. So God, when he wants us to come to him, and look at verse 18. Or I'm sorry, verse 15. Luke chapter 18, verse 15. 
It says, Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for as such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. So when you come to God, there's nothing we've done as a small child when we come to God and we have to have this whole thing figured out, right? He says, come in. What do we do? We drop down and put our hands up. We surrender to God. But we come as a child. We don't have all the answers. Yeah, we're going to grow in Christ. We're going to grow in this Word. We're supposed to mature. We do. But when we come to God, let God do His work in you with the Holy Spirit. He will. Come with and as kids don't have all the answers, do they? We don't have all the knowledge when we come in the door. We don't. We're the same way when we come to God. We come as children. And God grows us. He strengthens us. And we mature in Him. So it's really careful about these other folks who we're talking about who come up and say, hey, you need to do this, 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 and this. And you may have just met the Lord and you've got this joy and you're excited about God and everything's so awesome. And then they come up and you're like, well, I'm not doing this and this and this and all these things. I'm like, I'm not, you know what I mean? What happens? You feel like you can't do anything right, right? That's what I'm telling you. Come as a child of God. Come as a child. Come as a child. And God will increase you. Your knowledge, your strength, and your understanding. The Holy Spirit's going to show you what you need to know. And of course, we're going to have preachers and teachers, right? Who are going to edify the flock. So let God do His work in you, not you yourself. Okay? Amen. So anyway, the grace of God. Can we finish with a prayer? Brother Al, you want to wrap it up for us with a prayer? Sure. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we would just like to, to thank you for the word that we've received tonight. We thank you for your, your grace, your favor upon each and every person that is here. Help us to understand that we don't deserve your grace, your favor, but uh, because of your kindness, your mercy, and your love for us, you bestow freely upon those who put their faith in you. So we want to thank you for this great benefit of being a child of God, and we want to ask you to continue to do this for us. And we just pray that you'll continue to lead us.